Did you know Full Metal Alchemist draws from and contains many parallels to real-world philosophies and religions? Alchemy's arcane origins can be traced back many centuries throughout Asia and Europe and various movements of esotericism including Hermeticism, Gnosticism, and Theosophy. Theosophy has an observable motif in Full Metal Alchemist, as most of the homunculi can be seen bearing the Ouroboros, an ancient symbol associated with numerous cultures and traditions. It's also a central component of the emblem of the Theosophical Society, whose motto states, There is no religion higher than truth. Full Metal Alchemist the movie, Conqueror of Shambhala, takes things several steps further as members of the Thule Society seek to travel through the gate from our world to Edwards, believing it to be the mythical utopia Shambhala. A long-standing monument to Eastern religions, including Buddhism and Hinduism, the concept of Shambhala as a mythical kingdom or plane of existence was adopted by unorthodox Western schools of thought like Theosophy. As portrayed in the film, it's believed that many high-ranking Nazis, including Rudolf Hess, Karl Hauschofer, and antagonist Dietlind Eckhart's real-life counterpart Dietrich Eckhart, were interested in mysticism and the occult, and that some were members of an actual Thule society. The act of transmutation itself via transmutation circles is evocative of, well, evocation, the magical conjuring of spirits. In monotheistic religions such as Christianity and Islam, such practices are taboo, similar to the Ishvalans' religious aversion to alchemy. And speaking of Ishvalans, their god Ishvala sounds strikingly similar to the Sanskrit Ishvara, which, depending on the context, can mean God or Lord. Original author Hiromu Arakawa drew from numerous sources in order to create the striking world of Full Metal Alchemist. As hinted at by the countries in Full Metal Alchemist, and the stories about Father and von Hohenheim as the Western and Eastern sages, the cross-pollination of ideas between the East and West in our world has occurred for centuries via the Silk Road. An ancient trade network reaching across much of Europe and Asia, the Silk Road allowed for transmission of cultural goods, ideas, and religions throughout China, the Middle East, and Rome. This is not unlike the spreading of alchemical knowledge by Father and von Hohenheim to create a Mestrian alchemy and Shingiz alchemy. In an interview with French magazine Anime Land, Arakawa herself revealed her interest in such things during a conversation about future plans. I'd like to follow the Silk Road someday, writing an episode for each city I went through. It would be some kind of essay in manga form about that mythical journey. The problem is that it would mean crossing dangerous countries like Afghanistan. Today it would be complicated to go the whole way from China to Rome. I think I'll have to wait until peace comes back. Remarkably, despite all its ties to antiquity and fantastic settings, the fundamental concept of Full Metal Alchemist comes from Arakawa's own humble background. In the aforementioned interview, when asked about equivalent exchange and whether or not she practices it, she replied, This idea comes from my farmer background. You're nurtured to the level of the efforts that you've made. The more you love your animals, the more they give back to you. The more you take care of them, the better they will be to eat. Equivalent exchange is based on the energy you will use to realize the task in front of you. In a way, this exchange has given rhythm to my life. As a longtime reader of manga, Arakawa had several notable inspirations who also authored manga. In the book Full Metal Alchemist Profiles, Arakawa mentioned Suiho Tagawa, author of Norakuro, and Shigeru Mizuki, author of Gegege no Kitaro, as being influential, along with Kinikuman for her more muscle-bound characters. But perhaps one of the most influential figures to a young Arakawa was author Rumiko Takahashi. In particular, it's interesting to note some similarities between Arakawa's work and some of Takahashi's, like Inuyasha. For example, the manner in which Father creates his children by purging himself of his own unwanted feelings is reminiscent of Naraku's incarnations. In addition to both sets of underlings being created to do their father's bidding, both the homunculi and the incarnations occasionally refer to one another as siblings, and their individual personalities cause varying degrees of loyalty to their creator. When asked about the current cultural trend of more female authors writing shonen manga, Arakawa had a lot to say. It's primarily a matter of generation. Twenty years ago in Shonen Jump, there were several really violent series such as Hokuto no Ken or Sakigake, Otokojuku, and oddly enough, girls like those stories. Ten years later, we were old enough to draw and so we made boys manga. This explains the increased number of female artists in the field. 
As for me, I think it's difficult today to make a distinction between genres. Some men are able to imagine sensitive and complex characters, while some women are able to create violent action scenes. Nowadays, each writer has their own specialty. It doesn't matter if they're a man or a woman. Thanks for watching. We're Did You Know Anime, the anime trivia resource. Make sure you subscribe to us on YouTube and share this video with all the other aspiring alchemists out there. This is Chuck Huber. You just heard me narrate, Did You Know Anime? You might know me as the voice of Android 17, or Emperor Pilaf, or Hiei, or Dr. Stein, or Kulalu from Sergeant Frog, Hero from Shin Chan, and if you want to learn how to narrate, or how to get into the anime dub world, or how to do accents in Thioex, you can join us every Monday night at 8 p.m. for my master class. For more information, go to chuckhuber.org forward slash patrons. See you there.